Good morning, everyone. We're glad you're with us for the continuing saga of clashing worldviews in the U.S. Supreme Court. All right, and we left off last week talking about William Rehnquist, and he's a conservative Protestant, and so there's a unique upbringing that he had that was very different than the progressive liberal upbringing and education of um, uh, Harry Blackman. All right, so we're continuing here, and we're going to, again, we're going to talk about a number of other subjects related to his worldview. In other words, why you are the way you are. And, and so even as we're talking about William Rehnquist, and of course it's unique to him, all of you, all of these influences and these inputs in his life are the same inputs that input, that were inputs into your life. Now, you didn't go to Stanford and you weren't raised in, you know, a suburb in, in Wisconsin, but, but the point is, your family, what was talked about at the dinner table, uh, the church you went to or didn't go to, the school you went to, the college you went to or didn't go to, the books you read or didn't read, didn't read, that's good English, sorry, the books you read or you did not read influenced how you think, influenced your world view. Okay, so, so as we're talking about this, you know, you may be like, oh my gosh, he was in a league of his own, there's no... But the, the, the same inputs that affected him affect your life and affect your thinking today. I mean, there were, there were books that I've read that have made profound, profound impact upon my life. Okay, obviously the Bible, mm -hmm. but other books perhaps that, that you've read that have just changed your thinking on things or really helped you or, or spoke to you or, you know, and, and sometimes books are... There's a season for books. You know, there's a certain season you were in that, oh my gosh, that book totally spoke to you. And then you go back and look at it, you're like, uh, uh. And, but then there's other books that are like timeless that suddenly you're like, hey, this spoke to me then and it speaks to me now and it's just, it's something for all time, okay? And, and so when we're talking about um, F.A. Hayek and his book, The Road to Serfdom, okay, this was a book that Wayne Rehnquist read when he was in Casablanca. Pretty cool. He had a pretty cool gig in World War II. He was he was on a, in a tower, and he was with the weather department of the U.S. military during the war, and uh, he had a lot of downtime, and so he could read. And so as he's up in a, in a tower waiting for weather to appear in the desert where it's beautiful every single day, you know, I think Southern California, that's kind of, you know, that, that's why he went to Stanford, because he's like, hey, the weather is very similar to Casablanca. It's pretty sweet. So, but he, so you read this book, and, and the road to serfdom is basically, it says this, um, socialism is not a good thing. The fascism that came out of Germany with Hitler, it's an outgrowth of socialism. Government control of businesses so that masterminds behind the scenes can control prices, can control what is bought and sold, can tell certain people what job you can have or not have, it's not a good thing. And, and Hayek's book was very, very significant, okay, without getting into this too deeply, but because it, people in the know say that that book kept Western Europe from going into rabid socialism and communism, the free part of it, obviously the part that was controlled by the Soviet Union, well, that's another story. But it, it, and it kept America from going into full-blown socialism, okay? You may know this, you may not know this, but the brain trust that informed uh, FDR in the 1930s and 40s, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, many of these individuals went to the Soviet Union in the late 20s, about 20 or 30 of them, and they went there to figure out how the Soviet Union can control the economy and set price controls and, and control the price of gold and, and all these types of things because they wanted to bring it back to the United States. So much of what FDR did in the 1930s was based on the Soviet model, a little known secret. Where do you get this information from, Pastor Eric, from the book I referenced last week? Amity Schley's book, The Forgotten Man. Schles is S-C-H-L-A-E-S. -E and there's a significant part in that book where she basically connects FDR's thinking to this trip where they went. And again, this idea that the thinking is, gosh, the Soviets, their economy is great. And because, again, we did not know what we know now, right? You know, 
Soviet communism is responsible for the death of like 60 million people. You know, there's not enough body bags in the world to account. It's bad. But at that time, they thought, oh my gosh, this is maybe because you had the Great Depression going out, right? And this idea that people are helpless. Oh my gosh, what do we do? I don't have a job, whatever. And the thinking is, hey, a bunch of masterminds behind the scenes in Washington can control everything and we can bring this economy out of the slum, okay? Does anyone know when we got out of the Great Depression? When we went to war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically, yeah. The, the common assumption, particularly taught in schools, mm -hmm. is FDR, by golly, his policies, the control of the economy, and the New Deal got us out of the Depression. And that is not true. We technically got out of the Depression in 1943, actually two years into World War II, because of the demand for complete production for a wartime footing. Okay, so, but, but, so, so the popularity within the American people for a, a uh, government control of the economy was really huge. And then enter F.A. Hayek, who said, uh, no, we're actually on the road to being serfs. What's a serf? A serf is a peasant is a person that is at the mercy of everyone else. He says, if you go that direction, okay, you're going to get into a big, big mess, okay? And he actually, Hayek ends, ends up winning the, the Nobel uh, Prize um, uh, in economics, okay? Again, I don't want to get into all this, but basically, here's what he said, okay? Um, he said, uh, he, he contrasts two opposing philosophies of socialism and individualism. The individualism developed in elements provided by Christianity and the philosophy of classical antiquity appeared fully formed during the Renaissance and then it spread into what we know as Western civilization. The essential features of individualism, Hayek wrote, are the respect for the individual, man as man, man qua man means man as man. That is the recognition of his own views and tastes as supreme in his own sphere, however narrow they may be circumscribed, and the belief that it's desirable that men should be free to develop their own individual gifts and bents. Okay, thinking Christianly about this, okay, because again, this is secular economic theory that's drawn from Christian principles, okay? The idea that you can own your own property, where does that come from from a biblical conception? In other words, your property is your property is not everyone's, right? We tend to understand that, right? This is my computer, not Ruth's. If you take it, I'll get mad at you. Okay, <laughs> where where do we get this idea that you know my land, my dirt is my own property, my house? Well, it's owned by the bank until we pay them off. But you know what I'm saying, right? That from a biblical perspective, why do we understand that? Does that come from the inheritance that God gave? The what, do you, what do you mean? The inheritance that he gave to each of the tribes of Israel. Yeah. Okay, sure. It, uh, yes, I think you can even get even more fundamental than that. Where do we get this idea that we, we can have our own property? It's assumed in America. It's assumed in political theory. It's assumed in this idea of individuals, individual rights. You have a right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Okay, right? It's in the Declaration of Independence. Right. It, you know, that's based on you know, uh, uh, classical uh, political theory, but it's also based on a biblical concept. The Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not steal. There you go. That's what, yeah, that's it. Thou shalt not steal. <laughs> What's the assumption? That individuals have certain things that are their own, that are God-given. Correct? Whether it's your Pick your stuff, your, your home, your towels, and your, your computer, whatever it is, okay? That is a key presumption there, okay? Another aspect that affected America's founding was the Reformation, okay? What's the Reformation? Where we broke from the, the Catholic Church, we tried to re bring a reform to this idea that, okay, wait a minute, I don't have to go through the Pope to go to God, I can go to God by myself. I don't have to wait for someone else to read the Bible for me, I can learn to read and read the Bible for myself. Sola Scriptura, the scriptures alone are authoritative, not the word of a priest or a Pope, right? They get, right? This idea, another idea within the Reformation is, we, I am not answerable to a Pope, I am not answerable to, for someone else to read the Bible for me, I am answerable to God on my own for my spiritual life and for my reading the Bible and for my understanding the scriptures, okay? 
that led to this idea of individualism. Is that Ruth is not responsible for my spiritual life and I'm not responsible for Ruth's, right? We're both going to stand before God and have to answer for how we serve God. Parable of the talents, anyone? Or something like, right? That concept of individualism filtered into the American founding. Okay, in other words, the Reformation had a big effect on the American founding and this idea of individual rights before God. Okay, now there was a secular strain of that, but, but again, I'm trying to help you think Christianly. Why do we think that I should own my property and the government shouldn't take excessive taxes and redistribute it to people that don't have? Right. In other words, I'm trying to help you because a lot of times what we'll do is we'll find a political position we like and then slap a scripture on it to justify it. Which came first, the, the, the chicken or the egg? Okay. As Christians, what should come first for us? The scripture, which leads to the principle. Not the principle that we have to quickly slap a scripture on to justify it. Right. You follow me? So, so this idea that, that personal property is a person's own from a Christian perspective came from the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not. In other words, this assumption that there is some property that is uniquely your own, and it also came from the Reformation in the you know, 17th, 16th, 17th centuries, this idea that individually we're going to have to stand before God. So there's individual rights you have from God. You have rights, but you also have responsibilities before God, right? Again, that thinking percolated within the American founding. Transfer that, fast forward to Hayek, okay? So what he says, again, he says, um, he explained that individualism developed from elements provided by Christianity. That's this idea. Does that make sense? In other words, didn't say it there, but I'm helping you fill in the blanks, okay? So, so again, that, that's really, really important. So in other words, as a Christian, we would have... Okay, let me rephrase it better. As conservative Protestants who have a high view of the scripture, <coughs> we're going to generally look at the idea of personal property rights as connected to some form of this idea of, of, of the uh, Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal, this idea of individually standing before God, we're all responsible before God, okay? A progressive Protestant would tend to go, yeah, but what about all those scriptures about justice and caring for the poor? And, and so, so they, they might read uh, uh, Luke's gospel where he talks about the Beatitudes and this idea of blessed are the poor, okay, where it says uh, in Matthew, it says the poor in spirit, but in Luke's gospel, it says blessed are the poor. So they're going to read into that, well, perhaps government should redistribute it to help for the poor, and they'll overrun individual rights. So that, okay, just trying to help y'all, okay? Which is right, Pastor Eric? Both. Both are right, okay? From, from a conservative Protestant view, we would, we, would, we would have no problem helping the poor. But we don't see government as the solution to do it, right? That, no, that's, that's a key distinction. We're cool with helping the poor. We're fine with justice, all those kinds of things. And, and in some respects, the law courts are responsible for justice. They surely are. But knowing God's version of justice, we understand it's the Lord's work in the Lord's way. And government is not the way. Okay? Anyway, trying to get back to Hayek here. Okay, so, so Hayek is, again, he's drawn from Christian principles to say, listen, socialism, this idea of redistributing wealth, to poor people through the government and government controls, uh, no, that's going to actually lead us to, a, we're going to be a bunch of serfs, a bunch of peasants, as that we're all, as to, to borrow from Winston Churchill, okay? Um, uh, uh, capitalism is the unequal sharing of blessings. Socialism is the equal sharing of misery. Okay, in other words, that's this road to serfdom, mm -hmm. is that if, if, you, if you suddenly redistribute and take from the producers and give to the consumers so that we're all equal, we're all going to be equally miserable. Okay, that's this idea of serfdom, that Hayek's saying you can't go that way. See what you just said about capitalism? Is the Cap capitalism is the unequal sharing of blessings, right? Because some people are blessed more than others because mm -hmm. others, you know, some people work harder, some people have more gifts from God, some... Some people have inventions that others don't have. It's the unequal sharing of blessings. 
but socialism is the equal sharing of miseries. I, I'm, I'm right now reading my third Winston Churchill book. Well, it's an audiobook. It's like 50 hours. I try to find audiobooks that are like really long because I just, I enjoy them about, and he's it's just, so his quotes are just, I love his stuff. But that's one of my favorites. That's one of my favorites. Okay, so so does that make sense? So so th that had a big effect on, on, on um, Rehnquist. Why will this be important? Because when we get to chapter six, and it's a property rights case, you're going to see him going, uh, no, the government should not redistribute, in this case, a, a waterway to take from a private landowner and give to the public. He's like, wait, you, property rights are really important. You can't do that. Okay, whereas black men are like, hey, no problem. Hey, we can take from somebody, whatever, because it's everyone's property. If you carry Marxism and socialism to its conclusion, if you've actually read Marx, everything is in common. Women, men, there is no marriage. There is no, it gets real creepy real fast. But if you've actually read, you know, his stuff, which I had to read in grad school, you're like, okay, this is getting really creepy right now. I'm not comfortable with this at all, okay? Because again, this idea of private property, there is none, okay? I'm, I'm, this is not in the book, but I'm gonna add this because I think this might be helpful to you, okay? What socialism is, is a shift from individual rights to property, individual rights to freedom of conscience, okay? In other words, you're free to believe whatever you wanna believe, individual rights to um, political rights or whatever. It's a shift from individual rights to collective rights. When I say collective, that means the people, society. And who decides those social, societal rights? Well, by golly, the elites in government do, okay? So this is a quote from um, The Promise uh, of the American Conception of Liberty by Frank Goodnow, okay? He wrote this in about 1910 or so, I don't know, some early, early 1900s. He is a progressive, he's arguing for socialism. Okay, just trying to help you understand this idea of what, okay, why is socialism different than capitalism? And why as Christians do we, should we go, uh, I don't think so, okay? Again, this is a progressive. He's arguing from individual rights to collective rights. This is what he says, part of an essay. The end of the 18th century, what's the 18th century? The 1700s, when we wrote the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So that's what he's talking about. The end of the 18th century was marked by the formulation and general acceptance by thinking men in Europe of a political philosophy which laid great emphasis on individual private rights. They came from God, right, this idea. Man was by this philosophy conceived of as endowed at the time of his birth with certain inalienable rights. Thus Rousseau in his social contract treated man primarily as an individual and only secondarily as a, matter, as a member of human society. Society itself was regarded as based upon a contract made between individuals by whose union it was formed. That's exactly what the Declaration of Independence is. It's like a social contract, okay? That's what the Constitution is. It's based on, okay, he's not referring to this because this guy is not a biblical guy. The covenant, the, right? Isn't the covenant an agreement, a contract, if you will, between God and the people? And Moses asked them, do you agree? God asked through Moses, do you agree? And the people said, yes, we do. That's this idea of a contract, okay? Um, society itself was regarded as based upon a contract between individuals whose union was formed. At the time of making this contract, the individuals were deemed to have reserved certain rights spoken of as natural rights. These are individual rights. These rights could neither be taken away nor limited without the consent of the individual affected. Okay, so he's talking about, again, this idea of individual rights we have. God didn't, the government didn't give it to you, and the government can't take it away. Right? If they're God-given, government, if government takes them away, government is now illegitimate. Right? That's the premise of our founding. That's the premise of a Christian principle. Okay? That's, that's a, a, a James, was it James and John? Judge for yourself whether it's, or Peter and John, judge for yourself whether it's right to obey God or man in Acts 5. In other words, hey, you're taking away our right to preach. <laughs> hey, these are God given, and hey, judge for yourself who's right, the government, the, the religious government establishment, or God. Okay? Now here's the shift. The last sentence. Such a theory has no historical justification. 
Remember what I talked about with progressivism? That it's based on historicism, right? Remember historicism? What is ultimate? The flow of history. Newest is truest. Latest is greatest. So when he says it has no historical justification, this thinking in the 18th century of individual rights are given to us by God, history has changed. We've progressed. We've moved forward. That's old school thinking. Modern people, according to new modern conditions, think differently. That's what he says. In other words, what he's saying is this idea of inalienable rights from God are not fixed and permanent. They're subject to historical change over time. So if society starts thinking differently, we reject that. That makes sense? That's progressivism. In other words, nothing's fixed and permanent. Everything is fluid. Everything is changing based on, again, Darwin, based on Hegel. Again, this idea of Hegel, this idea of uh, there's a dialect, there's a thesis, there's an antithesis, they collide, it creates a synthesis. In other words, ideas, principles, they're always changing. Nothing's fixed and permanent. Whereas a Christian, a conservative Christian, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Thou shalt not steal is true for all time. That doesn't change. That individual right that you have to your own property, that never changes. I don't care what history thinks. I don't care what, what I don't care if I'm on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. That is still true. Okay? Progressives who tend to embrace socialism say, no, 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 no. All that's subject to historical change. Okay? Moving on. Again, I'm trying to help you understand this thinking of, of why our culture has shifted towards more, become more open to socialism. Okay. So when did he write this? He wrote this about 1910, 1912. Okay. The fun thing about reading the progressives, the early they were very open and honest of what they're doing. They're not this current group today, they try to hide everything. Everything is sh shrouded in secrecy and and these guys, they were very open. Which, which is really refreshing because you can really understand what they're thinking is. He goes on to say the political philosophy of the 18th century, again, that's the philosophy of our founding, was formulated before the announcement and acceptance of the theory of evolutionary development. He's paying homage to Darwin, right? Remember what I said about Darwin? Darwin Darwinism and evolution was troubling enough when it was in the biology lab. But it didn't stay there. It bounced over into the politics, and it bounced over into law, and it bounced over into ethics. In other words, everything is now evolving. That is, the, that, that is the assumption of most secular people. Everything's evolving. Everything's changing. Okay. Now, are things changing? Sure they are. Sure. In other words, we don't, as Christians, I want to be real clear about this. It's not like we're like, we want to stay back in the 1950s, or we want to go back to, you know, Little House in the Prairie, and that's the old. No, there is no golden days of yesteryear, because there's people involved and sinners. But there are certain principles that anchor you, even as change happens. Okay, the progressives rejected all. They're no, they're, hey, we'll pull the anchor. We're, the ship is just drifting wherever the historical currents are taking us, or whatever the most the majority of people think is right or true. Okay, that's progressivism. Okay, so so he's referencing evolution here, saying evolution causes us to think differently now. All men are created equal. That is not permanent. It's changing. It can change and. You follow the, the current sexual revolution right now? It's plastic man. There's not, you know, think Stretch Armstrong, right? That's what human nature is. That's what human sexual, it's Stretch Armstrong. You can, hey, we can malleable, we, we, it's plastic man. We can change gender, whatever, okay? See what happens? Yeah. So he goes on to say, the natural rights doctrine presupposed almost that society was static or stationary rather than dynamic or progressive in character. You see that? So he's rejecting fixed principles in the founding, and he's saying things need to be dynamic and progressive and always changing. Um, it was generally believed that at the end of the 18th century, there was a social state which under all conditions at all times would be absolutely ideal. The rights which man had were believed to come from his creator. These rights consequently were the same then as they once had been and would always remain the same. Hello, amen, because they're based on fixed eternal principles. God doesn't change. The principles don't change. 
He says natural rights were in theory permanent and immutable. Natural rights being conceived of as eternal and immutable, the theory of natural rights did not permit their amendment in view of a change in conditions. So he's, he's, he's saying, hey, listen, things have changed. And because society's changed, uh, our form of government needs to be changed. And what he's pushing for is, is a shift from individual rights, again, to collective rights. Okay. Um, change conditions has been thought to bring a train in their train different conceptions of private rights if society is to be advantageously carried on. In other words, while insistence on individual rights may have been a great advantage at a time when the social organization was not highly developed, it may become a menace when social rather than individual efficiency is a necessary prerequisite of progress. You see what he's saying? He's saying, he's saying listen, what, what, and he's arguing for government. The role of government is to ensure social progress. Continually keep pushing, moving the goalposts. Keep moving the goalposts because we're going to progress, progress. And one of the ways we progress is we reject individual rights. Your rights are not individual now. They belong to everyone. So everyone can get into your cookie jar and pull out of whatever. I mean, you deal with the racial thing. You know, you deal with affirmative action. This idea of certain races need to be pushed up in hiring and in education, not based on merit, not based on the fact that they're smarter than anyone else, not based on the fact that they've got a higher test score, but based on the race, right? This is the idea that your individual right to succeed based on your, the work you do in studying and preparing must give way to the social right of the government picking winners and losers for you. You see, in other words, this is not just an economic thing. This has, you know, you throw, you throw in affirmative action, it's that same idea, okay? But again, the current government that thinks that this kind of stuff is okay got their ideas from guys like Frank Goodnow, okay? No, but I'm trying to show you the original. For me, it's always helpful, maybe not for you, but for me, I look at the pedigree of, I, I, I have to, where's the source? Where did this come? How, okay, I get where we're at, but where did this come from? Okay, what I'm reading right now is a great, where does this come from? It helps you see the thinking. Okay, it rejects God as creator. It rejects God as given individual rights. It says now social expediency determines your rights. And so if, if, if the, all the rage right now is racial equity, then we're going to start pulling from the race that's in charge or seems to be in charge, the white race, mm -hmm. and give to other races. Because again, your individual rights to succeed based on your own human initiative must give way to collective rights based on what the government wants them to be. Mm -hmm. What Goodnow is talking, he's talking about how this all came about. Okay? For social efficiency probably owes more to the common realization of social duties than general insistence on privileges based on individual private rights. As our conditions have changed, as the importance of the social group has been realized, think identity politics, as it has been perceived that social efficiency must be secured if we are to attain and retain our place in the field of national competition. So we're trying to be socially efficient. And if you know anything about identity politics, I need my rights, I need my rights. You know, in each race, the sexes, women's rights, men's rights, homosexual rights, uh, Latin American, in other words, it's, it's what I call the Balkanization. If you know what Balkan, the Balkans, if you know that, that area of the world by, by Greece, it, it's always been war prone because everyone shifts into its own little tribe and it becomes this whole tribalism thing. And there's always war. That is very much cultural Marxism, this idea of tribalism. And that's kind of what he's pushing for. Group rights over individual rights. And government can pick the winners and choosers. Winners and losers. Okay, this is the conclusion. In a word... Man is regarded now in Europe contrary to the view expressed by Rousseau. I don't know why he keeps referencing Rousseau, because Rousseau was the first hippie. And I, anyway, but that's a whole other deal. As, as, okay, the man is regarded in Europe as primarily a member of society and secondarily as an, indiv as a, as an individual. The rights which he possesses are, it is believed, conferred upon him not by his creator, but by the society to which he belongs. So rights are given to you by society based on what society thinks you should or should not have. You know, 
Are your rights very secure then? No, they're very arbitrary and they're changing based on the whims of however the societal winds are blowing, okay, whatever culture is doing. Um, what they are is to be determined by the legislative authority in view of the needs of that society. So legislature, government determines your rights. Social expediency, rather than natural right, is to determine the sphere of your individual freedom of action. Okay, to that, Hayek said no. Okay, to that, Rehnquist said no, we're not going there, okay? Again, this is not in the book, but I'm, I'm showing this to you because, again, I, I felt that this was really a, a very clear. I mean, you, you don't, isn't this pretty clear? Can you see the difference? Yeah. Yes. Is, is this idea. And you can see what happens when you reject God as the giver of your rights and you defer to government. Mm -hmm. So, Any? you would never say <clears throat> yes to this. This is what he's writing. Yeah, that's exactly what he wants. Okay. Yeah. And Rehnquist said no. Right. Correct. Yeah. So, so, again, this is a progressive. Good now is a progressive. Good now is advocating for what we understand today as socialism. Again, this idea of socialism, your rights are social, not individual. They're collective, not individual. They belong to society based on what government decides to give you or take away, and not yours. So... In the case that is, is discussed in one of the footnotes in this book, um, Baki versus uh, the Regents of California, a, a white guy who was applying to medical school in California in the mid-70s was turned down twice, I think three times, even though he had a higher MCAT score than a minority individual who had a much lower score. And he was denied law school two times, it might have been three times by the time he got to the court. And again, this idea of collective, it, it's socially more expedient to help a minority race, affirmative action, give them pride of place over somebody who is actually more qualified based on his test scores. And the Supreme Court actually sided with, the, with Baki. He actually won the case. In that case, uh, a black man dissented and he was hot because he, he thought rights are collective, rights are social. Rights are based on the whims of what culture is doing, and it's, it, it, it's a better idea for uh, the government and culture and medical schools and colleges to prop certain people up that have been pushed down than based on individual merits, because rights are collective and social, not individual. Okay? That, again, I'm trying to help you. I, w I was hoping that this would help you understand socialism a little bit better. Because you throw the term, well, I'm, I, as a, I'm against socialism. Well, why are you against socialism? Where in the scriptures does it say that you should be against it or you think it is not based on a Christian worldview? Okay, do you know now how to answer that a little bit? Like, Thou shalt not steal, <laughs> right? Individually before God. The side of individual responsibility before God. Maybe the parable of the talents. Okay, the parable of the talents is not an economic parable. But it does say that God will hold us accountable for our, for our talents and our abilities. And if we don't produce for the master, even what we have will be taken away from us. That is so anti-socialism, it's unbelievable, right? I mean, you're so, Bernie Sanders, if you heard that, would be like, ah! Right? He's going to be just going nuts. Wait, that's not... Wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold on. Our values are not the values of the world. They're the values of the kingdom. And it's pretty clear in Scripture. If you don't work, you don't eat. In other words, there's certain things in Scripture that reveal to us that individual initiative is really, really important. And you are individually responsible for your intellectual property, right, for your physical property, taking care of your money and all those kinds of things, right? And so, so we would see, a conservative Protestant would, would look at those things. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions on this? Well, I think what we're seeing is, as far as your slide up there, I think what we're seeing is that right now, you know, because the government keeps giving us stimulus checks, people aren't going back to work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Why should I? I can sit home and get 600 bucks a week. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Some then, are still, yeah, I know of an individual who's in their early 20s, still getting, mm -hmm. going to college, mm -hmm. still getting it. 
and yet there's businesses that oh yeah all over hire. the place yeah it's hiring all over the place and can't find employees right. yeah hello right mm -hmm. right right yeah it's disincentivizing so, work it right. it's yeah. it's yeah we it's would incentivizing work and it creating a greater reliance on the government yes yeah. right yes yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, even with the affirmative action years ago, because of the hiring, you know, like even with the police departments, Michigan State Police and everything, where you could have the individual, the, the white individual who excelled, no, couldn't be hired, just like that lawyer, you know, so it had to go to a minority. And so what does that do to a person's... You know, it's oppressive. Where's the motivation then to accept? Right, it dis it disincentivizes mm -hmm. yes. initiative, work, whatever. Because if you realize, mm -hmm. wait a minute, mm -hmm. it's not equality of opportunity, it's now equality of outcome. Mm -hmm. It's outcome based, right? Based on what the government wants. Suddenly, not, yeah. And it's a different way. Yeah, yeah. it's, 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 it's well, a different it way. It happened in construction also that in sure. order to get a minority, the job, the contract, he couldn't perform, so he had a joint venture with a denied minority. Right, so now, yeah, you've also incentivized, incentivized some form of mediocrity or something like that. You know, and as Christians, we would be totally fine with helping people and helping minorities. But, you know, this idea, you know, we, again, we would apply, if you don't work, you don't eat, parable of the talents. In other words... The parable of the talents encourages initiative, and encourages excellence, mm -hmm. it encourages accountability, it encourages your utmost for his highest, you know. Um, we would also look at, okay, God gives gifts, right, spiritual gifts and all kinds of gifts that he gives. Mm -hmm. And so we would say to somebody, perhaps they can't cut it in a particular field, well, perhaps that's not your giftedness. How about you do what you are in what God has made you to do? That's where you'll flourish and you'll thrive. Because what the way God made you, I have no doubt in my mind that Doc Sherry loves looking at medical journals. I have no doubt in my mind she loves studying medical textbooks. Why? Because it's her giftedness. It's how God made her. So the way God made you, you naturally love stuff that would make other people go, yuck. Okay? I love looking at academic journals in law and politics. I love that. I was just doing some of that this weekend. Then most of you would gag. Like, are you, oh my gosh. But, but again, that, that's how God gifted me. That's how God graced me. Okay? So, so we would respond to the minority group or the minority contractor that can't cut it. Perhaps you need to find something else to do based on your skill set and how God made you. Perhaps God hasn't made you to do that. Some would say, gosh, that's a really harsh thing to say. But from a biblical standpoint, we would understand, no, that's actually a very gracious thing to say. Because from a biblical standpoint, your spiritual gifts, do what you are. Okay, I playfully say this, I'll say it. You don't want me fixing things at this church. You don't want me building things. I, I'm not good at it. My grandfather built Lake Michigan College. Okay, He was part of the Pearson construction team that built that. He was. I used to get toys as a kid. He would make me B-25s and B-17s and, 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 and Sherman tanks for Christmas made out of wood. They were incredible. Why we didn't keep them, I don't know. But we should have. Okay, I didn't inherit any of that. Okay, I didn't get it, but so so, but but there's certain things that I am good. In other words, do that. That that's where you flourish and you'll thrive. So, again, I'm trying to help you think through affirmative action from a biblical standpoint. It's an act of compassion to direct somebody towards what they're really good at and away from perhaps what they're not good at. It's hard. It's not fun. Did you have a question, Phyllis? Or well, I I do have a question. I want to know. Okay, so there's. They're so smart and all that, but what? why can't they see that what they're trying to do has not worked in other countries and has just put the other countries in bankruptcy? Because our generation will figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Socialism's failed in 
in in in uh, you know the Soviet Union and 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 we'll pick you know Venezuela, but we we'll figure. And so there really is that thinking. Hey, we'll figure it. We're smarter than the previous. You know, I know there's 60 million body bags. I know that, but you know, we'll do it better. We'll do it more humanely here in America. There really is that thinking. They don't learn, people, you know, you are doomed to repeat failures, right? If you don't learn from Santayana, right? You know, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. But when God places something in our heart to do, for Doc Sherry, that was placed in her heart by God. Yeah. Eventually, she came to the realization that this is what my calling is. This is what I need to be doing. This is what I'm happy in. This is what... I am experienced in, and I can go forth and do this. I told this to a couple of little girls yesterday. I asked them, what would they like to be? And one of them said, well, I'd like to be a dermatologist, but what I really would like to do, I'd be, like to be a cosmetologist. I said to her, I said, well, whatever is the greatest dream that you have in your heart, I said, that's what you need to go for. And if that doesn't work out, then go for the next one because you know where God will want you. He will place you exactly where you're supposed to be. Yeah. You know, when I used to clean houses, it was <laughs> it was something else for me. That was something I was called to do. To, and I did it because only for the purpose that it helped people. Not that I was going to get rich at it, but it made it easy for somebody else, but it was so easy for me to do it. And it was something that I did from a little girl, from the ages of 10 and 11 years old when I was cleaning my mother's home. So it's just one of those things that what's ever instilled in you, God has already placed that within you. When it came down to doing factory work, I could do a multiple things, but I never found anything that I really wanted to do until I come to evangelism. That I really want to do. That's yeah. embedded in my heart. And that you know, and that's a signal of a spiritual gift that's within you. And, and I want to say this clearly. There are times I'm sure what Doc's doing, there's times when I anybody. It's hard. It's not fun. You know, it's actually work. Yes, it is. But th there's something within you, there's a grace within you, and there's a love for what you do. Isn't there? That you love it, that you love, learn, you know, usually a real clue to what God is assigning you to do is when you're doing it, you lose all track of time. You know what I'm saying? Where, where suddenly, you know, you're like the absent-minded professor. You're just totally lost in whatever you're doing. Okay, that, that is a really good clue. Okay, but that that's... You know, I. And, and the other thing I want to say is we're living in a generation where we actually have options. Our previous Christian brothers and sisters, you know, even 100 years ago, and beyond, they didn't have all the options. So sometimes you just had to just do what was in front of you and do it as under the Lord and be faithful, whatever. You know, we, we actually have the privilege of living in a, a culture, society, where we've got options now. You know, but, but again, this idea of tr trying to look at affirmative action Christianly. Trying to look at socialism Christianly, you know, at the risk of repeating myself again. I have no problem helping the poor. I have no problem with those types of things, but I would not see that necessarily as through the government, okay? Could I see a merger? Like, like, like they've got some things up towards Grand Rapids, because I know this because of teaching in Allegan, where it's a merger between government and business, to help, like a jobs training program, to help young people or people that are out of jobs, hey, you can go to this place for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, and you can learn some skills so then we can get you back out there. I like that, it's like a merger between government and business, yeah. but, but, but the end game is people are gainfully employed with a skill they didn't have before right. in an industry that is now th thriving versus the one that was dying on the vine. Okay, that's, you know, in other words, though, think, Huh? It's similar to what Michigan Works does, and we've got that here. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of that. Michigan but, but you know, in other words, trying to think of solutions, it's not so much saying, hey, that socialism's bad. Okay, what's the solution? What can we do? Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think things like that are really good, really healthy.
And in other words, it's not, and I'm not, I, I want to also be really clear. I'm not demonizing government for doing some of the things it does because the Bible says very clearly, Romans 13, we need government. But the way to do it, even, okay, even FDR and, 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 um, and uh, Johnson with his The Great Society, it was a good intention. It's not like they were bad people. But the, <laughs> the way they were going to do it, let's throw trillions of dollars at poverty. We'll defeat it. Uh, isn't that kind of like what they're doing now with this here $300 a week unemployment all the time? They're throwing it at the yeah. people and well, you, people yeah. don't even want to work. You've got the twin tensions of governors keeping everything closed. Mm -hmm. You know, so no, you can't work. And then the flip side is here, we'll keep giving you. And like the sad thing is... And the downside is over time, it causes more people. Why even try? You know, it's the rare man or woman that says, I don't care if I get less money working a job. It's the right thing to do, and it's a dignified thing to do to work because God made us to work. He did. God made us to work. Work is not a curse. Work was pre fall of man. You've got, and some Christians don't understand that and say, Yeah, work's the curse. No, it's not. No, it's not. Look at Genesis 2. Dressing and keeping the garden was pre fall. So, it's, it's actually a good thing. It would actually be a biblical thing to go to work, even if you make less money than you get with unemployment. Aren't they kind of missing but, out on some of the things that they're supposed to be doing in their life when they sit back and right, do nothing yeah, at all? Yeah. You're hiding your talents in a napkin, like Jesus yeah. would say, or something I, like that. Um, yes. Yeah. My sister-in-law, she's in charge of um, in a, a regional area on the TA truck stops. In all these little restaurants and everything, and here in Sawyer, um, she's trying to keep everything going. And the manager in the other end of the truck stop was filling in the gaps of um, people not working. And he just called her up. He says, "I can't do both. I can't do this." So they had to shut all the, the restaurants down. So those people that are working are now. On unemployment mm -hmm. because the place shut down because they can't keep up with it. They just couldn't, you know. So it's all. I think they're all shut down except maybe the Popeyes, but and they can't get open them. Yeah. And that because they can't intent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I hope not. I've heard that. I've seen that. A nefarious attempt to try to crash the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. I. I don't know. I hope not. Cryptocurrency, anyone? Yeah. You know, yes. yeah. is that a reason to get them into socialism more? It could be. Uh, just uh, it, it, part of that, and part of it is just there's a mentality within the left. You know, tax and spend. That's the way to do it. The, you know, but the problem is we're at what thirty some trillion dollars, and that doesn't include about one hundred and fifty to two hundred trillion dollars of unfunded liabilities. You can't keep going in that. You can't. You cannot keep going. There's sooner or later you will hit what's called a debt wall. And it'll collapse the whole thing. Aren't we there now? <laughs> it's oh, we're pretty close to we're it. We're living on borrowed time. It's such a joke <laughs> and deception because with one hand, they're saying, okay, we're getting more free now. Businesses, businesses can open. But then behind your back, they're paying all these kids to stay home. I know. I mean, it must have got this going through the same thing. She worked 73 hours one week because she's trying to cover so many people. Well, as long as she's paying her, as long as she's paying her fair share, that's all. Yeah. You don't think this government's intent to create a greater reliance on the government? We're recording this for all of general public, and I'm not going to get into that right now. <laughs> I have strong opinions on that that will go unstated right now. But maybe yeah. privately we can talk. You might want to mute it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, it's 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 concerning. Yes. It's very concerning. Okay, moving along. Okay, we, we've kind of already talked about this, but you know, you can kind of see, you know, the difference. Again, again, capitalism assumes private property. Okay, capitalism is not. How do I say this? It's not necessarily biblical, but it's based on the foundations of. Bi Biblical principles, the idea of private property, right? Thou shalt not steal, okay? Capitalism, um, The Wealth of Nations, written by Adam Smith in 1776, the same year the Declaration of Independence was written, assumes 
a Christian background, okay? It does. In other words, this idea that um, people will build things, make things, bake things, sell things. Again, his key premise in the Wealth of Nations was this. It's not because the butcher or the baker is a great guy that he's selling you a great product at a great price. It's based on self-interest. He's got to feed his family. And because he's got to feed his family, he's going to give you the best product possible for the best price so we can sell that stuff. Don't think he's a great guy. It is actually self. In other words, <laughs> if you understand capitalism, it's based on two premises from a biblical worldview. One is private property, but the second, the sinful nature of man, right? Because we're sinful, because we're incredibly self-centered, that's what capitalism works. Think it through. Because, uh, it, because it's all about me, because my general thinking is I'm thinking of three people all the time, me, myself, and I, or my family. I'm going to produce the best at the best price for you so you buy more stuff so that it helps me. Do you catch that? Mm -hmm. that, that that's, what, that's what Adam Smith, I'm, I'm, I'm basically making the wealth of nations very simple. That's, it, it assumes private property from a biblical perspective, and it also assumes human nature. Okay? Socialism assumes that humans are basically good. And that government can be given more power because government knows better, because rights are now collective, not individual. And so because of that now, Government is, 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 can control the levers of power, can set prices. Again, I think I told you this. <laughs> in, in The Forgotten Ways by Amity Schley, she says very clearly, uh, during the 1930s, the price of gold was set arbitrarily by FDR by whatever he wanted that particular day. Okay, that's frightening. Yes. That the president arbitrarily set the price of gold, not based on the market, but based on what he wanted it to be to help his government flourish. Okay? But that, okay, so that's, yeah, very different. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, companies live by the profit motive. It's governments, it is the government's job enforcing laws and regulations to make sure there's a level playing field. Equality of opportunity. Everyone gets an opportunity to play. Now, it doesn't mean everyone gets an opportunity to start. Right, think of a ball team. Everyone gets a participation trophy and everyone gets a start, right? They're seven, seven years old, right? But all I know is when my kids got into junior high and high school, it didn't, not everyone got a participation trophy. You better produce or you're not gonna start, okay? So, so <laughs> capitalism is this idea that government allows everyone to get involved in it, but it doesn't make sure that everyone succeeds. It, that's up to you, okay? Whereas socialism now, the means of production, money is owned by the state, and everyone works for wealth that is distributed to everybody. Okay, that's why Hayek said, hey, that's, that's the, the road to serfdom. Because it disincentivizes work. Why would I want to be better than anyone else? I should hand this out to you. There's, there's, a, there's a, a mini short story I give to my students by Kurt Vonnegut. If you've heard of Kirk Vonnegut, he wrote Fahrenheit 451. You probably have heard that title, maybe. Anyway, but it's it's called Harrison Bergeron, and it's about a culture where uh, where everyone's equal. So, it, and it talks about a husband and a wife. The husband's really smart, and the woman is not the sharpest tool in the shed. So, what the government did by passing the 213th, 14th, and 215th Amendment is the husband has to wear a, an earpiece in his ear that every 10 seconds this, this incredibly loud noise goes off. So as he gets a thought, it stops him thinking so that he's at the same level as his wife. <laughs> and, and, he, and he has to wear uh, like 20, 30 pound weights at, so, so that he is weak, as weak as his wife is in physical. It, it, it's absurd, but, but he's, what he's trying to show, the logical outcome of equality of, of outcome. In other words, this is what he caught. He goes to a, 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 an opera or whatever. There's ballerinas, beautiful ballerinas, with you know shapely in the whole nine yards. Well, the beautiful ba ballerinas have to wear these ugly, grotesque masks, and they have to wear this special suit that makes them look unattractive. In other words, this idea that okay, everyone's finally equal. This is what it looks like. In fact, the, the, the story begins, and the year was 2071, and everyone was finally equal. It's trying to show. A true story. It's, it's, no, it's, it's okay. science fiction. No, but it, it's it's trying to show if you follow affirmative action, if you follow socialism, this equal distribution of everything, 
this is what, and I give it to my students because I want them, many of whom are socialists, many of whom are very sympathetic to this. Okay, okay, let, let's talk this out. Yeah. Because what is socialism? It's the equality of outcome. Everyone's equal. Do you like that? Would you like all of you that are getting A's for me to pull your points and give them to those that had D's so that everyone in this class gets a C? Are you okay with that? Because that's socialism. Everyone's equal. Again, to borrow from Winston Churchill, socialism was the equal sharing of miseries. It's <laughs> like, okay, we're all equal in our mediocrity here. You liking that? In other words, yeah, anyway. So, does that make sense? You know, so it's crazy. And, it is very interesting in teaching 18, 19, and 20 year olds how many of them bristle at what I just said. <laughs> they get mad. Oh, I just, hey guys, I'm just, I'm just trying to show you. I'm just trying to help you. Yeah. Few people take logic to its conclusion. I'm taking logic, so that's why I give them Harrison Bergeron. Why do I do that? Because my professor, Jim's, Jim Davids, the first guy on the book, that's what he did when I was in grad school at Regent. He gave us all that. He goes, guys, read this. Before we start talking about affirmative action, let's look at this thing. Let's think it through, okay? This is what equality of outcome looks like. Yeah. And uh, Anyway, go, you can check out Harrison Bergeron. You can look it up. It's online. You can download it's, it's only three or four pages. It's real short. But when you read it, you're just like, to me, it was like, my eyes, I get it. I get it now. I really get it. This is what it looks like. It's crazy. Great word picture. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, that, I mean, there's, there's more here with this, but, you know, <laughs> capitalism, you know, healthcare is left to the free market, right? We're, we are a socialist economy when it comes to the healthcare market, right? One sixth of the US economy was socialized when Obamacare passed. Okay, that, that is very much this idea. Um, Doc, would you like to weigh in on socialized healthcare? Do you like it? Do you not like it? What are your thoughts? Let's put it this way. I had a PA that grew up in Canada, and she said that she would never practice in Canada because of socialistic medicine. She was a um, hopeful for the Olympics, and I was really, she was a gymnast, fantastic gymnast, and she was going to go to the Olympics. She blew out her knee. It took her four months to get an MRI. Mm -hmm. Poor chances of ever getting in the Olympics, ever getting that MRI and getting any restored. But she got free health care, right? Oh, that's right. It was free. You can come back. Didn't so what's wrong? Her. It's free though. Didn't take care of her. That's right. Oh, yeah. there, there's no way right now, and you know, I'm not sharing any hip and stuff because I'm putting in Molly's on out there. There's no way that Molly would have been able to go to Mayo get the assessment, get the evaluation that she did in a matter of a week from my saying that she needed to go to Mayo and have um, have diagnoses in the week that she did. No way, no way. Now, so technically, because I know the Trump administration pulled a lot of the, the requirements for Obamacare, and it's still not all in place, despite the current administration trying to get back to it, right? In other words, Correct. because, she, because she was able to do that, the Affordable Health Care Act is not totally in place. Because had it been, place. it could have taken her longer. <clears throat> it could have, well, it would have taken her longer. She would, number one, she wouldn't have had the access and ability to do that. Right. Um, and she certainly wouldn't have been paid by insurances. Several years ago, I spoke at a Tea Party rally, actually. And they wanted me to weigh in on the Affordable Health Care Act. And I said, it's affordable for no one and destroys everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. Basically, what it's doing, I, I brought this guy up that was, you know, six foot four and weighed three hundred pounds or something. I said, "Okay, do you and I wear the same size clothing?" Of course, it was a chuckle. And I said, "What we're asking is the same care, same health care for everybody. When's the last time you used birth control? You're going to have to pay for it. When is the last time that I needed a vasectomy? I never did. Excuse me. We're all going to pay for it. So equalization led to, and the idea of equalization leads to nothing but bondage and greater pain and more people out of." It's nuts. It is an absolutely nuts situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this, again, you take the younger generations, yeah. they, they very much, and, and in fact, what I've taught probably no less than 20 classes on American national government in the last five years. Mm -hmm. I, every time I share stories like this, the students are like, we haven't heard any, we thought Obamacare was great. In other words, yeah. because they, in the secular media, and the way it's sold, exactly. 
it, it's to me it's breathtaking that they don't really see and I, I've shared I've got horror stories I could share too but for the sake of time I won't but yeah the, um, Jerry and I just had a huge eye awakener I mean when he had his first cochlear implant we knew it was over fifty thousand dollars we just got the bill for the cochlear implant he just had it was a hundred Twenty-eight thousand five hundred and some dollars. Now, who's paying for that? Ah, well, y'all are. Yeah. I go. That is the crazy. I mean, him and I looked at each other, and it's like, why would they charge increase yeah. it? That but you could. My my dad always told me this, and I believe right. it. If if the, if the medical industry, whether it's pharmaceutical, big pharma, whatever, was was truly the free market. The pricing would go down because the average American, would be like, yeah. hey, I can't afford it. either. They're not going to get it, or it's going to force some way to get the prices down. But yeah. if you realize, hey, it's punted to the government and taxation policy, what's the incentive for that right. doctor or whatever to to, to lower their yeah. prices? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, in five years, such yeah. a big jump, and I mean, in my mind, like. So you can hear somebody's paying for this. <laughs> I mean, we're thankful for that and everything, but I just, it boggled my mind to be, for that type of money being, somebody's paying for that. Yeah, and, that, that, and on one hand, that sounds really great, sounds really great, and then you hear this, okay, but what if somebody desperately needs something? Now, have you heard stories of people in America as Obamacare kicked in, had to wait for a particular surgery or whatever that kept them from. Oh, absolutely. When uh, the Medicaid is a good example, okay, and gee, we can't do that. So yes, I mean, as, as it's under the Obamacare, um, yes, there is waiting of that. The private individual insurance is not still, is not subject to that. Sure, I mean, a perfect example, and I thought about this all of last year during COVID, um, we suddenly, that's like, guys, this is what socialistic medicine is going to look like. Surgeries were canceled, mm -hmm. okay? So you can't get in COVID. So it didn't matter. I had a lady that needed a mastectomy for breast cancer. Sorry, we're not doing surgery. Mm -hmm. We're not doing surgery. You know, yeah, your knee can wait. Okay, you've had pain in it. You've had pain in it for the last three years. You're gonna have to wait a little while. But mandatory, necessary surgeries were being canceled because we didn't want to affect the OR with COVID. I had a patient that died because they could not get a surgery. I went ballistic and brought that to administration at the hospital and everything fell on deaf, deaf ears, absolutely deaf ears. And I said, guys, this is what socialistic medicine looks like. You will wait longer, you will not get the care that you need, you will not be able to get in with your practitioner. Right, because your rights are collective that individual and again Frank Goodnow what he's saying you know wow. and a lot of people bought into that it's like oh but the problem with this is again if your health care rights are now collective the government can choose the timeline and all that kind of stuff and pick winners and losers and and the hospital's answer I, I kid you not the hospital's answer was temporarily hire more physicians or hospice because we knew as a result of decisions we're making here, there's going to be a greater death toll. So please come and work more hospice because we're going to have more patients die. Wow. Because surgeries weren't being done, care wasn't being done that was necessary. The law of un unintended consequences or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, we're going to close, but I want to close on a positive note because I realize this gets intense. But can you see where mm -hmm. a biblical understanding of rights and property leads to flourishing and where an absence of it leads to all kinds of problems? Again, this is why I, I try to stress this, let, let, you know, as we're, we're, you know, we're tackling some pretty tough subjects here, but I want us to approach it from a biblical root system why it leads to more flourishing than, again, the collectivization of rights, which is a big, it's a big deal right now, with the, especially with the current administration. And, and we would say, 
Again, if you go against the principles of Scripture, you cannot flourish. You cannot be blessed. You just can't. And so with that, we will close for this week. Bye, everybody.